So I'm Paji. Very good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Ayan Topatundru. I'm with the Indonesia Project. Actually, I just joined uh, an Orton Department of Economics Corporate School. And it's very good to be here again. Actually, I was standing here presenting Indonesia at Economic Update, actually, in 2006. It's very good to be here again. And uh, as my new task, as the new guy in the Corporate School, my new task is to actually moderate this uh, economic update. So with us here are uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, we have Paul Burke, Budira Sosudarmo, and Neil McCullough. And uh, the economic update will be uh, presented by uh, Dr. Paul Burke and Dr. Budi uh, Sosudarmo. So Dr. Paul Burke is the research fellow at the Uncoordinated Department of Economics. And of course, Dr. Budi Resource Darmo is an associate professor and yeah, also the head of the initial project and the Gordon Department of Economics at the Crawford School uh, here. Uh, so they are going to present this economic update, and uh, I believe uh, they will be uh, updating us on economic development, uh, some recent economic policies, all, all, and also important issues like uh, uh, community boom, tourism and also, I believe, green economy. So with that, I believe we're going to start uh, with this part. Thank you very much, Arianto, and it's a great privilege to be here to present the economic update with my colleague, Udi Resto Sudamo. I will be presenting the first half of the update and then passing it on to Udi to finish it up. I'd like to start just with an overview of what we're going to be talking about during our time today. We're going to cover five different areas. First of all, an update on the macro economy. The basic story here is that the Indonesian economy, as was nicely pointed out by Richard Wilcock, is showing high resilience at a time of slowing growth in the region and also falling commodity prices for key commodity exports. The second topic that we're going to focus on today is a look at some of the trade and policy environment changes that we tra trade policy environment changes that have happened this year and also some changes affecting the mineral sector and that are particularly likely to affect future investment in this sector. The third topic is one that the president, President Gudiono, has given a lot of priority to lately certainly in terms of speeches, but also in terms of some actions, is green growth. Uh, we're going to have a review, what does this mean, green growth? What has been happening? Uh, and talk about some of the challenges uh, to actually moving, move towards a green economy in Indonesia. The fourth topic is a look at two big booms which have been very important in changing the Indonesian economy over the last decade. The first of these is a boom in coal, and the second is a boom in palm oil, oil palm plantations, which used for palm oil. These two booms have provided substantial economic benefits, but they've also had some environmental implications. We'll, we'll discuss these. Number five is a look at a smaller sector, the tourism sector, but one, the tourism sector in Indonesia outside Bali remains relatively underdeveloped. But we talk about whether it's a potential sector which might be able to be part of the story for green growth in Indonesia. First of all, the macro economy. Economic growth in Indonesia has been remarkably stable. I'll show it on a graph on the next slide. Uh, but the economy as a whole grew by 6.4% in real terms over the year to June. So that's the latest reading on economic growth. Inflation has also been very stable. Over the last five months, it has hardly varied at all uh, and is safely within Bank Indonesia's target range for inflation, as we'll see. This year, the stock market has gone up. There was a dip in May to June uh, related to the problems in the European economy. But over the 12 years to now, uh, the stock market is up about 12%. The exchange rate continues a gradual depreciation. 
Uh, so over the last 12 months, the district depreciated or lost about 8% of its value against the United States dollar. <coughs> Something which has caught quite a bit of attention just in the last uh, six weeks or so has been the current account deficit. There has been a spike in the deficit on the current account, which is now, in the second quarter of 2012, reached 3.1% of GDP, which is about six, more than six billion US dollars. This is mostly due to the slowdown externally during the second quarter. Uh, so Indonesian exports fell off and commodity prices fell as well. Uh, so mostly it's an external problem, but it has led to some policy re reaction uh, domestically, particularly focusing on trying to uh, reduce import growth, which uh, we think is a, an unnecessary reaction to, an, to a spike mostly caused by uh, external, deteriorating external conditions. Economic growth. Indonesia's economy, the overall economic growth rate, is remarkably stable. So this is data for the last two years, and this is year-on-year -year growth rates. For the last six quarters, the growth rate essentially hasn't changed. It stayed in the range 6.3 to 6.5 for the last uh, six quarters. When you compare that to some other countries in the region, it's quite an achievement. So for example, Indonesia's economy has slowed down over the last year and is now growing at a slower rate than Indonesia's economy. China, of course, is still growing faster than Indonesia, but as we can see on the graph, has had a slowdown in its economic growth rate over the last year. Having a look uh, at this economic growth rate, so Indonesia, Indonesia's growth rate is 6.4% per annum. Let's look at the expenditure components in GDP. Private consumption still continues to grow slower than the rest of the economy as a whole. So the latest reading was 5% per annum. So the share of private consumption in the economy continues to fall and has now hit about 54% of GDP. What is pulling up this growth rate? Partly it's government consumption, which grew at 7% in the year to June. But really the big story is investment expenditure. Investment expenditure increased to 12.3% uh, per annum in the year to June. And this is both domestic investment and also foreign investment is growing quite strongly outside the mining sector. The big story in the year to June is a change in the external environment. Uh, so there was a, a very large fall in the net export surplus. So this means exports minus imports. Mm -hmm. There is a surplus there, quite a small one relative to the whole size of the economy. But in real prices, that surplus fell by almost 30% in the year to June. So this is mostly because of the slowdown in exports. Imports growth is maintaining the normal sort of rate of 11% or so, but the export growth rate fell right off, which led to this big fall in the net exports balance. Inflation. Inflation, as I mentioned, is very stable. So this is consumer price inflation for the last uh, 12 months. Monthly data, but year on year inflation rates. For the last five months, inflation has basically stayed flat. What is not stable though is food price inflation. Over the last six months, food prices have spiked uh, and now food price inflation is, is quite a lot higher than the overall consumer price inflation rate. There are two reasons for this. One is international factors. For example, the drought in the United States has led to a big increase in the price of soybeans. Domestic policies also have exacerbated this price increase. For example, uh, tightened import quotas on beef and live cattle have contributed to a 10% increase in the beef price on average at the retail level in Indonesia over the last year. CPI inflation as a whole though is safely within this Bank Indonesia target rate. So Bank Indonesia has a target rate of, for this year of keeping CPI inflation between 3.5 and 5.5%. It's safely within that range and as a result, over the last six months, there haven't been many changes in monetary policy. A couple of small ones, the deposit, deposit facility rate was increased slightly in August, but essentially monetary policy 
hasn't uh, been a very interesting area this year. Foreign direct investment. The balance of payments data indicate that net inward foreign direct investment has increased quite strongly. This number is in nominal terms, a 13% increase in net foreign direct investment. This is if we exclude the mining sector. Net foreign direct investment in the mining sector actually uh, is negative. If we look at the other sectors in the economy though, there's quite a lot of strong investor interest in Indonesia. There are indications of numerous projects in the pipeline in Indonesia. A lot in manufacturing, but also services, and projects ranging uh, from petrochemicals to chemical goods, uh, to consumer goods, and also the services sector. Why is there strong foreign investor interest in Indonesia? Partly it's due, mostly it's due really to the buoyancy of Indonesia's economy. A big economy growing quickly, uh, while other countries in the region are slowing. And the basic attractiveness of the economy, there's money to be made there, it's a big domestic market. Rather, it's not so much due to policy improvements that we've noticed over, that have come in over the last 12 months. And of course there are still hindrances to foreign direct investment. There's still things which are not so attractive. For example, infrastructure is often cited as, as a constraint to foreign direct investment. Also human capital, which of course uh, is why, why the topic of today's update of education is such a good one. Number two is looking at some policies, uh, the policy changes this year affecting trade and investment. First of all, I'll focus on the mining sector. There's been a big year of change this year in the mining sector. I'll go through some of the, the big changes. First of all, uh, there was an introduction of divestment requirements. So this means that foreign companies investing in minerals, uh, so for the moment I'm excluding, uh, we're not talking about oil, gas and coal, let's talk about the mineral ores. Companies from overseas investing in this sector must now start to sell off their equity in mining entities from the sixth year of production to reach 51% domestic ownership by the 10th year of production. This is something, this is a change which obviously will reduce the attractiveness of investing for foreigners in the mining sector in Indonesia because there's less time during which to get some returns on the big investments required for mining. Another big change was a ban on exports of 65 raw materials which came in two different stages. The ban is already in place. Uh, Minerals that have been processed can still be exported. So this is a ban on raw material exports. This is really part of a, a broad focus on sector by sector value adding, which has been seen affecting other sectors also. For example, the rattan sector, late last year there was an export ban put in place for rattan to encourage furniture uh, production within the country. The mining changes are a little bit complicated, so exports of the raw, raw materials are still allowed until 2014, but only if companies indicate that they will start to do domestic processing themselves or they'll get someone else to do it in the country. Um, and also, these exports are subject already to a 20% tax at the border. Not all companies are immediately affected by this change, so some companies operating on the long-standing contracts of work are not yet affected, but there's an indication they'll need to comply in the future. Uh, these new changes led to some real effects in the trade data. So for example, uh, during some months, uh, there were large falls in exports of nickel, uh, copper, and also bauxite. I think it's useful to, to have a look at this idea of domestic processing. This is quite a, a big idea at the moment in the Indonesian economy trying to take restrictive measures, export bans, to try to have a larger domestic processing sector. There are several motivations for it. I'm just going to look at two of these motivations. The first motivation is to try to get more of the benefit from minerals, which are, the, uh, which are owned by the state and are for the benefit of the people, trying to get more of the benefits from minerals for Indonesians, uh, which, is, which is a good goal. But unfortunately, requiring domestic processing is an extremely inefficient way 
of doing this. The reason is domestic processing for some of these minerals is likely to be very inefficient in Indonesia. Min mineral smelting is a very costly business. It can cost billions of dollars actually to have a competitive uh, smelting facility. If it's more inefficient in Indonesia than overseas, then this actually reduces the benefit of minerals for companies that take the minerals out of the ground. So it actually reduces the value of the minerals to mining companies. There are much more efficient ways of collecting rents from the mining sector. For example, a rent tax or improved auctioning systems for, the, for mining permits. The second mo broad motivation for this policy is to encourage a domestic manufacturing sector. There's little rationale really though for focusing on minerals processing. Minerals processing is very capital intensive, very energy intensive, it requires constant electricity and a lot of it. Uh, it's very resource intensive, has environmental implications and provides very few jobs. It's not like garment manufacturing or something like this which provides benefits to many people via employment. Minerals processing is, is not so beneficial uh, in terms of employment. So there's little rationale for this policy based on uh, trying to boost manufacturing. It's not the first sector that you would pick if you were trying to pick a sector uh, to be supporting. This year the trade environment has also deteriorated. I'll just quickly go through a chronology of some things that have happened. In 2011 there were tightened import quotas for beef and live cattle with an aim for self-sufficiency in these products by 2014. In May there was a tightening of uh, import license requirements. So for example, importers can only import one type of, of uh, product, some importers. In June there were restrictions on horticultural imports at the main port in Jakarta. This has actually been slightly relaxed for some countries. So now Australian goods, for example, can enter, uh, but Chinese goods definitely cannot. In August, after the balance of payments numbers were announced, there was a broadened tax holiday for the production of capital goods. So it's the import substitution policy aiming at capital goods production. Also new anti-dumping policies were announced. August also saw the President announced an enhanced role for Bullock, which is the state logistics agency, uh, to, to have a role in managing additional commodities, not just rice, which might also indicate further uh, walking, or further disengagement from international commodity markets for these products. The overall stance at the moment is well reflected in this uh, quote from the Minister for Economic Affairs, which was the Coordinating Minister for Economic Affairs, which was made subsequently to uh, the release of the balance of payments data. Uh, so Hato Rajasa said that in the medium term, government policy is aiming at reducing imports as much as possible and increasing exports. This is quite a, an outdated thing to say uh, of course, imports are a good thing. Uh, imports also are used for productive uh, purposes. Uh, so the majority of Indonesia's imports are either capital goods or raw materials used in production. And at the, in the current time of global production networks, of course, a lot of business involves importing, doing something to the good, and then re-exporting that good. Uh, yeah, so, so the overall policy environment in, from that respect is slightly worrying. Moving on to topic three, green growth. The President has made several speeches about green growth, including uh, at the United Nations Conference in Rio de Janeiro uh, in the middle of the year. The government has also adjusted its development uh, mantra. So it's now pro-growth, pro-job, pro-poor, pro-environment. <laughs> the pro-environment is a new addition. Green growth is had wide support. It's becoming a very popular idea and it's had the support of, for example, the World Bank, United Nations, ADB. They've all released documents in support of the idea. The APEC Leaders Forum in Vladivostok also supported the idea. What is green growth? Green growth is economic growth that does not overly compromise the quality of the environment. Okay. The idea is not to slow growth, but the idea is to uh, trying to address market failures, which are currently seeing economic growth lead to uh, some environmental problems, environmental degradation. So green growth ideas are, for example, to price externalities. If you pollute, then to, you should have some price against that. To certainly not subsidise uh, pollution, 
<coughs> and also to make sure that open access resources such as forests are adequately governed. We're going to talk about uh, three areas that touch on green growth. Uh, so I'm going to talk about energy subsidies and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and then pass on to Woody who will talk about forests. Indonesia currently has very large subsidies for fuel, road, gasoline and diesel, and also for electricity. These subsidies really are the opposite of a green growth type policy because they're encouraging the use of fossil fuels, particularly oil, uh, and also they're leading to excessive pollution. This year there was a proposal to increase the fuel price, so the subsidies mean that the, the price at the pump is lower than uh, it should be. This year there was a government policy to increase the fuel price, but uh, there were some protests and uh, some other political developments and in the end the President didn't really give a whole lot of support, put his full support behind the, the reforms which were proposed. In the end there was a compromise solution agreed in the Parliament. It was agreed that the fuel price would be increased if the in Indonesian crude price reached a really high level, on average over six months, a high level of $121. Since then, the oil price has eased a bit, so the trigger for a fuel price increase has been avoided. The draft budget for next year is certainly not green when it comes to energy subsidies. There is a huge 36% increase in nominal terms in energy subsidies proposed for next year. For fuel subsidies, the increase is 41% which is ginormous. Uh, there is a proposal to increase the electricity price next year by up to 15%, uh, but even with this, the electricity subsidies will be increasing by more than 20%, according to the budget. The energy subsidies now account for 24, well, in, for 2013 and proposed to account for 24.1% of central government expenditure. So really, this is a, one of the main things that the government is doing with, the, with their money is subsidising energy. When President Yudhoyono entered office in 2004, this percentage was 24%, so basically the same. So this on its own certainly is not uh, going to win the President a, 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 a... He's not going to be remembered as a green reformer based on this energy subsidy data. <laughs> Greenhouse gas emissions. Indonesia is one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases in the top uh, five with different estimates. The President, the government, is committed to reduce emissions by 26% against business as usual by 2020. 2020, of course, is, is a long time after the President will be leaving office, will be leaving in 2014. Also, it's important to note that the business as usual against which they made the commitment has not been formally locked down. And there are some big uncertainty, there's many different ways to calculate business as usual. Uh, so basically, really this commitment still is malleable. Um, the president will be leaving and also business as usual against which it will be evaluated is not clear. There are some plans for activities to reduce emissions, for example, under the National Action Plan to reduce emissions. Um, but there is no movement on uh, in the energy sector at least, any economic signal to help uh, move towards a lower carbon energy system. Emissions from energy are increasing quickly, 4.4% per annum over the decade, mostly because the economy is expanding and energy use is increasing. But emissions are also being stoked by increasing use of coal. Coal is becoming a larger share of the energy mix and of course is very high carbon. There is a plan to expand geothermal energy in Indonesia, a very ambitious one. So the government has announced a second crash program of electricity capacity expansion, of which geothermal would be about half of the expansion. There are lots of challenges in expanding geothermal in Indonesia. Uh, this is a very ambitious goal, um, but challenges are numerous. Technical, uh, human capital as well. You need very uh, good engineers to, to get geothermal going and also some institutional ones. For example, geothermal is managed by local governments, which often have low capacities for it. All right, I'll pass on now to Woody. Thank you. Uh, thanks, 
Before I start my presentation, please allow me on behalf of the Indonesia Project to thank Pak Primo, uh, the Indonesian Ambassador for Australia, for his support during his stay in Australia. Pak Primo is going to going back to Jakarta soon, so for a new assignment, uh, selamat bertugas Pak. Uh, so my presentation will be uh, discussing several issues that is, uh, according to us, important in terms of determining whether Indonesia will be willing, uh, will be able to turn its growth path into a green uh, growth path. So there are four issues that I would like to talk about, but the center of this issue is actually about uh, forests. Uh, the, the president has committed that it would like to sustain Indonesian forests. The main issue with the Indonesian forests is certainly deforestation rate is relatively high. If you look at this deforestation rate between 2005 and 2010, it is high, much higher than other forest-rich country, uh, other forest-rich tropical country, other tropical, other rich, other <laughs> tropical forest-rich countries around the world. Yeah, yeah Brazil, <laughs> Congo, and Sudan. Uh, although this number, uh, the 2005, 2010, is relatively lower than before, and, if, and uh, a claim by the Ministry of Forestry that the number for 2011 has been much lower. Well, policy much better, but many people say that the reason for this lower deforestation is just because it's harder to find a good wood uh, right now. You have to go so far inland to get it. Uh, rather than uh, because of uh, policy. So there has been a pressure for Indonesia. There has been demand, both international and domestic, that Indonesia should reduce this deforestation this, this rate. Forest is important for Indonesia. Still, millions of people depend on uh, this forest as their livelihood. And forest is, Indonesian forest is important for the world, uh, for climate change issue. And for a long time, Indonesian forest has been known as the lung of the world. So there has been some that we call progress. Uh, people might argue it's not, but uh, we consider this progress. In May 2011, the president uh, released a degree, uh, basically banned new permit to clear primary forest and peatland for two years. So it is, will be until May 2013. Uh, it is quite short period, but the fact that he is able to make a decision and never been uh, like this before is to us is an achievement. However, there are several notes. There has been some discussion whether this has been successful or not. Implementation has been difficult. There are cases in which, you know, for example, in Aceh, local government did permit to palm oil on an unprotected area. So there are other cases like this. Uh, those who think that this is quite successful with that, well, there certainly there are cases, but it's not that significant overall.